Good evening and welcome to a second in a series of forums with candidates for office for this November 2nd that is being brought to you by Cuyahoga Community College and The Citizen, shown on Spectrum, Verizon Files, ARMA, the Auburn Regional Media Access, and played on the college's radio station 89.1. I'm your moderator, Guy Cosentino. On November 2nd, voters in the uh, third legislative district for Cuyahoga County will go to the polls to pick a member of the legislature to represent them. They currently have incumbent Benjamin Vitale, who is seeking a third term and facing two challengers, conservative and independent Jeffrey Emerson and Republican and independent Lydia Patty Ruffini. The third district of Kew County uh, encompasses the towns of Mentz, Montezuma, and Troop. The position of a member of the county legislature is a part-time position, although it may not seem that to anybody who's ever held the position, and it pays $13,500 a year. The 15-member legislature has six Democrats, five Republicans, one conservative, and three non-affiliated members, with half of the legislature up this year, uh, and four incumbents not running. So this year could change control of what the legislature looks like this coming January, depending on these elections. With the COVID-19 worldwide pandemic, we've had to uh, change the way we have done these county forums in the past. While all of our candidates are in the studios, we have limited the number of individuals in the studios with everyone being masked. Candidates, as long as they are uh, six feet apart, once they are seated, can take off their masks, which they have done. Representing the press today is a familiar face to those who uh, read The Citizen, Jeremy Boyer, the executive editor of The Citizen. And because of the COVID-19 protocols, he is remote for this forum and he is on the phone uh, joining us to uh, uh, ask questions of the candidates. Uh, welcome, Mr. Boyer. Thank you. Uh, prior to taping of the show, we had the candidates uh, draw lots. They are in the order. They will be giving their two-minute opening statements. That order will be reversed at the end of this forum for their closing statements. And we'd like to welcome all three of you into the studio. Uh, thank you for uh, being here and also uh, working with our students as we uh, tape our second forum. The candidates in the order of their presentations are the Honorable uh, Jeffrey Emerson, who's on the conservative and independent lines, Lydia Patty Ruffini, who is on the Republican and the for us, by us uh, line, uh, independent line, and then current incumbent uh, Benjamin Vitale, who is on the Democratic line. Uh, again, welcome. We'll start with our two minute uh, opening and closing, or excuse me, openings. And as we had said, Darian will have a stopwatch and a, uh, or his iPhone, and uh, a, a card to tell you when you have a minute and a half left, and we'll cut you off at two. So, uh, Mr. Emerson, again, on the independent and uh, conservative lines, welcome. Thank you. I'd like to thank the college for hosting us. Uh, it's important that the voting public understands what's going on in the districts, but also in the county. One of the main things that I have an issue with is the water project that the uh, County Water Sewer Authority wants to put into the southern end of the county. The first thing about that is, yes, we do need a second water source for the county. But my issue with that is, if anybody drives down Hanukkah Road, every house down there has what is called a storage tank for their sewage. If one of those tanks ruptures, it goes right straight into the lake and right near the new deep water intake location. We need to address that issue before we put the deep water in. Second issue I have is our fire and EMS service is in need of support whether we do a countywide fire service or if we do a shared services, we need to do something with our fire and EMS. And the other thing is the county executive. I know that Tuesday night, the board uh, reopened the position of the appointed administrator. But as a conservative, I feel we need to go to a full countywide vote for a county executive. And the last thing is the voters need a change. Uh, term limits were put in place for a reason. And at the end of the term limit, you need to go. I know that this is a two-year term. We are redistricting next year for the vote in 2023. How it's redistricted is very important. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Emerson. We'll now hear from uh, Lydia Patty Rupini, who is on the uh, Republican and the uh, independent line uh, for us, by us. Welcome. Thank you. And it's very important that the constituents from Mentz, Montezuma, Port Byron, and Troop get out and vote November 2nd. And it's also very important that you vote for me. I've been working for the last 20 months in our district, and many of you have seen me, have talked to me. Uh, we've spoken about our pains, our concerns, and uh, we also have issues that we are not feeling represented at the local levels. Uh, it's difficult to feel that way, especially when we face so many issues. Our farmers are facing, facing water quality issues. Our parents are facing issues uh, with bullying and hate in the schools. Um, we have veterans and senior citizens who are being underrepresented, underrepresented and who are lacking the services that they need. We have taxes increasing, costs increasing, uh, and the concerns and needs that we have are not being discussed at the local level. Uh, what they're voting on, we don't understand why. We're not allowed to speak in these meetings because we're being shut out. These are our meetings. These are our towns. This is our village. And this is our county. And it's important that we get back into these rooms and that we are represented. And that's what I'm going to do. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. We'll now turn to the incumbent, uh, Benjamin Vitale, who is on the Democratic line. Mr. Vitale, welcome as well. Thank you. Um, I also like to thank all the constituents that have supported me for the last two terms. Um, I very much enjoy uh, public service. Uh, I've served on the legislature now for seven and a half years. I've served on our school board for much longer than that, and I very much enjoy it and hope that you continue to so support me in the future. Um, why I'm qualified, uh, I'll tell you, I, I ran a state authority for 22 years for the regional market in Syracuse. I have quite a bit of experiences in all ends of government. Um, but one of the things I like to bring out in concerning with county government is, you know, we really need to focus on county um, issues and not national or state issues. And uh, I think that's what some of us have been trying very hard to do in the last few years, and I hope to continue to do that. I would like our county to continue to run more efficiently. Um, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of needs in our county. There's no, no doubt about it. But we also have a set of resources that we, we have, and we have to live within those resources. So there are a lot of tough decisions to be made. I don't mind making those decisions, and I hope you'll support me for another two years in making those decisions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Vitale, and thank you all again for being here. We'll now turn it over to Jeremy Boyer. I may have to interpret every now and then as we go through, as we uh, have uh, done traditionally, and it sounds like some of you watched the other night. Uh, we uh, will rotate the questions if they're for all of you. Uh, you'll have two minutes uh, to give an answer, and if you want to follow up even after you've spoken, just give me the high sign and we'll give you another minute and we'll continue that as we go along. If it's a uh, question for one of you specifically, you'll have two minutes for that and your opponents will have one and I will return to you again at least once uh, to uh, answer anything depending on what Mr. Boyer, uh, who comes up with all the questions, uh, has to ask. Mr. Boyer, welcome. Thank you very much and thanks to the three of you for, for taking part in, in this forum and, and uh, we'll try to cover as much territory as we can in the next um, hour or so and and to jump in um, I'd like to get your thoughts on um, uh, the use of money um, that the county is getting from the federal government as a result of the uh, the federal legislation um, that was passed earlier this year um, to support um, municipalities and in, in COVID-19 uh, relief efforts um, Cuga County has decided on a couple of uh, specific uses for that money um, renovations at emerson park some money that was put into a restaurant um, gift card program 
uh, to help local restaurants and some money for the health department to support its ongoing efforts. But there's still more than $10 million that uh, that remains and decisions need to be made. I know there was a presentation of a big range of uh, options that, that department heads have put forward um, that was made earlier this week, but there's uh, still a, at least a month and probably more from really diving into priorities. So I'd like to hear from the three candidates here on what they think the best use of, of these uh, really one-time funds would, would be for Cuba County. Okay, we'll start with uh, Mr. Emerson on this issue of the CARES Act and how the money should be spent. Yeah. The money that's coming in from the federal government first is a liability until it's decided what it's spent for. We have until 2026 to spend this money. So it should be logical, it should be timed out, it should be items that are a project that does not create a debt service. I think that the county right now has a good plan with the broadband because Port Byron had an issue when they went virtual with the student. There were certain areas of the district that had no internet access. That's a good thing to send the, and put the money into. Emerson Park has been there a long time. Emerson Park needs some upgrades. But also we need upgrades, like I said, in the EMS service. This money could be used for a one-time project of establishing some, a fly car program for the ALS units. Uh, it could be a, uh, established some of the water lines that were put in previously did not have loops connection. It could be used for some of those issues. Thank you. Mrs. Rufina, on this issue of the, the federal and state money that's coming to Kiwi County. Thank you. Uh, there are some restrictions and limitations on how this money can be spent. That would have to be sorted through. Additionally, there are some monies that we already get um, from the state and federal government. So we might not want to use those funds where we will already be getting other funds. Um, it's nice to spend the uh, money on Emerson Park. Um, it's severely underutilized. Uh, we rarely see people there anymore. Um, focus is on water. Uh, we have the algae bloom issues. Uh, and water quality, as I mentioned in my opening statement, is crucial. Um, I think that we need the constituents to tell us what they need. And we need to listen to them because this is their money. It's not ours. And it should be dispersed throughout the county. Uh, and not just focused, centralized in the Auburn area, although Auburn does support the outlying areas, uh, I think that we need to make broader decisions. Thank you. Uh, legislator, on this issue of uh, federal and state money that's coming to Kiwi County. Thank you, it's a great question. Um, <clears throat> it's a huge responsibility for the legislature to proceed with, and it, I can tell you it probably won't be decided before the end of this year. Um, we are establishing lists and each caucus will be talking about, you know, what their priorities are. Um, but you got to understand our legislature at this time, there is no majority, so it has to be a bipartisan decision, which is a really good thing for our county. Um, but one of the other things uh, we have to consider is that whatever we do with the money, we don't want it to be a reoccurring cost in the future. And there is a huge need for um, water quality. Um, we are looking at um, the sewer system, putting a sewer system on Hanako Road, along with all the other things that we're, we're looking at when the, in the water uh, and sewer authority. Um, but you also have to realize that there'll also be some infrastructure money coming too. So we can't make any rash decisions. Um, the money does, does have to be spent before the end of 2026, but the decisions and, and uh, commitments have to be made in 2024. So um, we, do have, we do have some time, but we also have to you know, move along and, and make good decisions in a, in a fairly, um, fairly good time frame and not rush it and not take too much time. Thank you. 
Do you have a, okay, we'll go to uh, Mr. Uh, Boyer. All right, um, I'd like to ask a few questions about the, um, the county's response and efforts um, to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, certainly a big part of that in New York State has fallen, has fallen on counties to handle. Um, so the, the, the first of those questions I'd like to put to all three candidates it's pretty simple. Do you support the Cuga County Health Department's efforts promoting the safety and effectiveness of the COVID-19 vaccines in an effort to get as many people vaccinated as possible? And, and depending on your answer, why or why not? And we'll start with Mrs. Ruffini on this issue of the COVID vaccine. In speaking with the constituents in my district, it's pretty mixed. Uh, I've been advised specifically not to um, talk about my vaccine status because I may be perceived as a leader in certain circles and I don't wanna sway anybody's uh, opinion or decisions. Um, we lack the information we need. There's so much data out there that is conflicting. It's difficult to say one way or the other if the uh, vaccinations are necessity. Um, there are standards that the Department of Health have put in place to protect folks, um, the masking requirements, the social distancing. I don't see anything wrong with that. Um, parents are concerned about masking children at the schools. Um, and that's a valid concern if you do the research. Uh, and the children don't like it either. Um, the younger kids don't complain as much. They get recess time and they run around and take their masks out then. Um, but parents are still concerned and we're seeing that concern in the schools, at school board meetings. Um, and the constituents really need to present themselves better. I hate to get off topic, but they need to present themselves better in these school board meetings. Uh, we need to be professional when we're having these conversations or we're not going to solve your problems. Um, so it's essentially something that we should be able to choose as far as the vaccinations. Um, our county needs to be a leader and not a follower of Onondaga County. Uh, we are not Onondaga County and there are too many dissimilarities. Um, thank you. Thank you. Legislator, this issue of uh, the vaccines and the county uh, efforts. Well, as a sitting legislator, I have to support our uh, health department and uh, personally I would anyhow. Um, the, the vaccines, um, I mean, I got vaccinated. I know a lot of people that have, but that hasn't, that doesn't necessarily fix everything. So we have to, um, as a, as individuals, we have to start being smart ourselves, protecting ourselves, doing the things that we think is, makes common sense. Um, our state and, uh, county people set certain mandates, restrictions, whatever, and we have to understand what they are and work within them. Um, and um, that's, what we're, that's what we're all trying to do right now. Um, most of our public facilities are mask facilities, and you know, we've listened to the, we've listened to the science, and, and it makes sense to, to them to those, do those things, so it should make sense to us to kind of follow that. And, but I think what, uh, what's most important is we all have to use common sense. We all have to, you know, work at this together. Um, fighting each other over it is not going to end the pandemic. Um, and I just encourage everybody to, you know, do what they think is best for them and use some common sense and be respectful of everybody else. Thank you, Legislator. Trustee, uh, your thoughts on this issue of the vaccine mandate? The, I am vaccinated, uh, mandate word puts panic in people's mind. When you mandate something, they just start, oh no, you're not gonna force something on me. For years and years and years, the state has mandated different programs on the county, and then it trickles down to the county taxpayers paying for it. The COVID-19 was a disease that came in and the only way to get around it was to shut everything down, mask everybody up, put everybody at home, make the kids stay home, and then they mandated this vaccine. I think that you, 
and your primary care physician should make the determination if you need that shot. We don't mandate the flu shot. We don't mandate the pneumonia shot. We don't mandate the shingle shot. So why mandate this shot? It should be between you and your doctor. They know your health better. That there was a statement this morning that a, a, a young man got the shot and now he's got myocarditis. I don't know. It should have been between him and his doctor. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Emerson. Mr. Ruffini, Mrs. Ruffini, you have uh, one minute to follow up as well. We also haven't taken into consideration the groups that I alluded to in my opening statement. We do have people who practice religion in our county. Uh, that was a right that our founding fathers gave us when they created our country. We have folks who have strong religious convictions. We have uh, communities, the Mennonites, which are, um, we have many of them in our district, and they are not being represented when uh, forceful vaccinations are something that are being mandated. And I think that we need to stand up for those groups. Thank you. Okay. All right. Mr. Boyer, you're back up. Um, i just like to follow up a little bit on, uh, just to kind of clarify um, with Mr. Vitale and, 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 um, and Mr. Emerson, um, Ms. Ruffini basically said that there's, there's questions about the safety and effectiveness of COVID-19 vaccines. Um, and I'm not quite clear on, on the, your, your two, your, your thoughts, because certainly the County Health Department is telling the public that they are safe and they are effective and they are important for fighting this. So where do you stand on that, that real basic question? Okay. We'll, we'll give uh, uh, Mr. Vitale, then Mr. Emerson, two minutes each on that, and Mr. Rufino, you'll have one minute to follow up since it's to the two of them. Mr. Vitale, you'll have uh, two minutes on this. I don't need two minutes. I, uh, I got the vaccine, so I figured it was safe. And uh, I know it doesn't work 100%. I know there's a lot of people in the hospital that have been vaccinated that have COVID. I know there's been people that have died that have had the vaccine. So its effectiveness is, you know. But I also see the, the reports every single day that um, there are less people getting COVID that have the vaccine than the ones not getting the vaccine. Um, I do work with a lot of Mennonites. I'm a lifetime farmer and I work with a lot of Mennonites and uh, they never bring any of these issues to me because most of them are working outside and it's, it's whatever they believe in and stuff is, is absolutely fine. But obviously when it comes to the safety and I must have figured it was safe because I got it. Okay, thank you Mr. Bartel. Mr. Emerson? As a licensed piano director, I got the, the, the vaccine as soon as it came out. <clears throat> we deal with every disease there is in the funeral business. So the vaccine, if it worked, doesn't work, I take it. I take the flu shot also <clears throat> because if you do get sick, it's not as serious as if you didn't have the vaccine. The problem with the vaccine is the mandate. I still think that when you force something on somebody, they immediately start rejecting it. The vaccine may or may not work for you, but it's up to you and your primary care physician to make that decision. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Nothing to add at this time. Okay. okay. Mr. Boyer, we're going to move on to the next question. All right. And then just to kind of step back, you know, sort of, uh, Looking back in time and looking ahead, you know, to, to some things that are that are coming up, um, I, I'd just like to evaluate, have you each evaluate um, the county government's handling of the pandemic. What has been done well, and um, what could have or can be done better? Well, oddly enough, this will go to Mr. Vitale first, who is the incumbent. So, uh, <laughs> how did you all do? <clears throat> well, I'll tell you, our health department is not built for a pandemic. Um, I don't think we want to build a health department in the future that can handle another one of these pandemics. Um, so we look for as much help as we can from the state. And um, 
we, we have added a lot of uh, part-time and, and temporary positions to deal with the um, testing, with the vaccinations and, and all that, but I can tell you we still, we don't have the kind of personnel that you would have to, to operate in this type of a situation. So we're really trying to do the best we, we can. And um, I know it's been very, very difficult for the people um, working in the health department and dealing with all this. Um, but I also know that we have some very committed county employees that are really doing their very best. Um, I've had to deal with it. I've been uh, quarantined once because of a contact and they were very, very polite and uh, you know, there were no issues. And so um, all I can say is we're not built for this, but we're trying to do the best we can. Thank you, Mr. Point. Uh, Mr. Emerson, this issue of the county's response. Right off the bat, the county did do what the state told them to do. But if it hadn't been for the nurses and staff at the community hospital, the Auburn firefighters, the volunteer firefighters that helped get the vaccine lines going to get people vaccinated when the first the shot first started, uh, I don't think the health department could have handled it. I think they would have just collapsed under the weight of what was going on. Contact tracing, the people in the health department that were calling people day and night for the contact tracing, I, you, you did your job. You, I mean, it's commendable what you did for the county. Going forward, we need to address this in a plan. The, the emergency management agency, the health department, they all need a plan for something like this to happen again. And if we have a plan, then you can open the plan, use the plan, and maybe even speedily do more than what they did. There was a lot of gaps in getting people. Town clerks were making appointments for people to get vaccinated. Everybody jumped in when they had to, but we need a plan. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Ruffini on the issue of the county's response. I think that the front line really did an amazing job in jumping in uh, and doing the things that had to be done to protect and to save. I think that there were a lot of unusual circumstances. There were many, many hours that they had to work uh, and they really are commendable and I thank them every time I see them. The county did a great job in following the initial directives. They forced down from the state what had to be done. I know that this was a difficult situation. I have 30 years of leadership, management, and business experience, and crisis management is something that we learn in business. We did not do the best job possible with crisis management because although we followed the directives, we did not analyze and assess and reassess and then modify as things changed, which caused a lot of financial strife for business owners. Uh, we had la laid off um, county employees. They were on unpaid furloughs, I understand. Um, and yes, there was unemployment for people who were laid off. Unemployment isn't equivalent to a paycheck. Uh, and people were unhappy. The schools were closed. This made uh, additional difficulties for the students. Um, Auburn School District had real challenges in getting students to um, do the work. Uh, it was a tough time, but we survived it. Hopefully we'll never have to see again what we did last spring. And thank you everyone who did such a great job in keeping us safe and healthy. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Vitale, you'll have one minute, and then Mr. Emerson, you'll have one minute. I would just like to remind everyone that September, today's the last day of September, but is, uh, has been the third worst month since the pandemic started. So um, it's not over. We have a ways to go. Um, so I just you know, want to remind everybody that you know, we're, we're still in the middle of it. We've made changes. Schools are open. Um, We'll be making changes probably 
<laughs> every month, but it's still going on. Thank you. Trustee, you have a minute on the subject as well. With the Delta variant being prominent now again, I am not going to be door-to-door -door -door campaigning. I am not going to subject the voters to me coming to your door, talking to you, going down the street, talking to someone else, and then find out that that person has been quarantined, and then you're subject to contact tracing. I'm not doing that. I hope you respect me for doing that but I ask for your support. Okay. Uh, Mr. Boyer. All right, uh, let's uh, shift to uh, um, the county government's uh, leadership structure. I know, um, I think Mr. Emerson certainly touched on it in his opening statement. Um, in terms of the, the long-term um, decision that needs to be made as far as um, how the county is structured, should it be <clears throat> the appointed, um, full-time administrator position that we had for about a decade until 2019 when um, that person was terminated and, and that position has not been filled since. Um, um, there's been calls or, or interest in instead pursuing a, a county executive, an elected executive office, which um, would be a multi-year process to get to that, but that ultimately would lead to um, a model like they have in, in neighboring Onondaga County or um, some other model perhaps the way it was before the appointed administrator where the chairperson was the de facto uh, CEO of county government. Um, so I'd like to ask you, each of you, what, you, what your stated or what, what your preference is for which way the county should go and why you think that would be the best model to pursue. So, Trustee, you get to expand on what you started off in your opening statement, and you have two minutes on this. Thank you. <clears throat> a county executive is someone that the voters choose. The appointed position has failed multiple times, and we've ended up paying lots of money in compensation. Two things that happen all the time is the board, the present board, appoints someone, a new board comes in, they don't like that person, they figure out a way to get rid of them. County executive voted by all the voters is there for a set term limit. In the, uh, just recently, the county adopted uh, a pay increase for the non-union employees and there's some issues with that. The county clerk brought those issues before the board. County executive would do more to pinpoint those issues and bring them out before an adoption of, of a plan. I'm, I'm in favor of a countywide elected official. Thank you. Mrs. Ruffini on this issue of uh, the structure of county government. I think that the people's voices need to be heard. I think that there should be a referendum and the people decide whether or not there will be an elected or an appointed position. I think that the way that it has been running is possibly not the best way. Um, when we hold multiple positions in the same room, sometimes it's hard to switch hats and there may be decisions being made from one hat when one should be made from another hat. Um, Personally, if it were up to me, I would believe that an elected position would be the right one um, because it is a selection by the people and uh, that gives the people the option of saying this is the best one, just like what they're doing for us now. They're saying that we are the best representatives. Uh, we should do the same with an important position like county executive. Thank you. Mr. Vitale? Um, <clears throat> this is this is a huge question for the for the county for the county legislature um, we have been trying to get information on this for a number of years um, we have one legislator that was supposed to head up the um, the charter um, information and things and we still haven't got anything from that legislator um, we just the other night um, passed a resolution to hire uh, a deputy administrator, somebody to actually help 
our, uh, our elected chair. Um, I think it's been totally unfair of the legislature to um, give her the total burden, especially with what's been going on in the last two years, and uh, then not expect to give her any support at all. Um, I don't care if it's an elected position or an appointed position. If you don't have support, we all fail. And um, I, just, I just know that there's going to be a lot of, there has to be a lot of discussion. There's going to be a lot of uh, push and pull. Um, but whether, it's, whether the elected position is better or not, I don't know. But all I know is if we do have an elected position, then the legislators have to change. We cannot have legislators that want to get into the day-to-day the -day operations of the, of the county. We have to have legislators that are interested in working with policy. That's going to be very difficult. Um, either way we go, it's going to be a, a road that's going to be hard to go down. Thank you. Mrs. Ruffini, you have one minute as Thank a follow-up. Uh, as um, we had talked about before, we do have money that we are paying to um, two of the appointed positions that uh, we shouldn't be having to pay. Um, additionally, there are other counties who are successful with this position being elected, and that's the good news. Um, we have seen the failures in our county and it might not be a bad idea if we look to the successes and learn from those. Thank you. I'm good. Okay. Uh, Mr. Boyer, you're up again, and a uh, question uh, for any of the candidates or all of the candidates. Yeah, um, and I, Mr. Vitale touched on the, uh, the appointment um, that was made this week. Um, the, the legislature in a I, I think it was a very close vote again but um, they, they, they voted this time to appoint or, or to to authorize the appointment I should say they haven't hired an actual person yet for it but to create an operations officer position um, that would basically um, provide be a deputy to the to the chair of the let you know the, the legislature chair in, in running the government on a day-to-day -day basis the pay would be about sixty nine thousand and the concept um, from what I understood it to be is this is sort of an interim step towards uh, keeping government running smoothly while the long-term decision of you know appointed administrator or elected executive or, or something else um, gets worked out um, so my question for all three uh, you know and it's kind of for mr. Vitale the the question and you, you did vote yes on that move um, this week so the, the question for you is of course why you did support it and the question for Mr. Emerson and Ms. Ruffini is, would you have supported um, that resolution that came up this week for the operations officer position? And we're next in line for first question is Mrs. Ruffini. Thank you. Um, I believe that the constituents would have wanted me to vote no on that. And the reason why I'm making that assumption is because we've had many conversations with many of the constituents in how our government is growing, how we continue to vote raises for the folks in our government, how we continue to stockpile on the people and add more people while, and, and we're redistricting because of this, while our population is shrinking. So the population's getting smaller, government is getting bigger. What makes sense? So I would have to believe I would have um, been asked to vote no by the constituents in my district. Thank you. Mr. Vitale? Honestly, I didn't have any constituent call me and tell me to vote yes or no, but obviously I supported it, and I'll continue to support it because, as I said in my two minutes earlier, is that you can't hire somebody to run an operation the size of, of Cayuga County and not give them any support. Our chairwoman right now doesn't even have a secretary. Now, now she has one, but most of the, the last year and a half, she hasn't even had a secretary. And show me an operation the size of our county that the head person or the lead person doesn't have some kind of support. It's about time some people showed up and voted to support our county. Um, everybody wants services from our county, but nobody wants to add any people and that, folks, that doesn't work. 
If you want services, it takes people and it takes resources. If we cut the number of people and we cut the resources, then you're going to end up cutting the services. Thank you. Mr. Emerson. I didn't read the resolution, but the chairman of the legislature has a burden that is tremendous. We have a $153 million budget. That's a lot of responsibility for one person to try and sort out and run the county day by day by day. I believe that she needs an assistant, whether it be an appointed administrator or an elected county executive. Even if we elect an executive, he's going to or that person's going to need assistance. So yeah, we've got to support the people that work on the sixth floor, but we also have to do it in a manner that's good for all the citizens of the county. Mr. Vitale, you'll have one minute. Follow yeah. up. Also, would like to remind the uh, the folks out there that our uh, chairperson has over 30 direct reports, and if you're uh, if you're running a business and you have 30 direct reports, it's almost impossible to do day-to-day -day stuff. Um, so without that kind of support, the, the doors of the, the county stay open, but it's really hard to move things forward. Thank you. Uh, we're just going to pause for a second, Mr. Boyer, to uh, tell uh, our viewers that they are uh, watching the second in a series of forums put on by Key Community College and the Citizen. This is for the third legislative district, which covers the towns of Mentz, Montezuma, and Troop. And we are delighted to have all three candidates in the studio with us today. We have uh, Jeffrey Emerson, who is on the conservative and independent lines. He's a, a trustee for the village of Fort Barn. We have Lydia Patty Ruffini, who is on the Republican and For Us, By Us party, which is an independent line. And we have the incumbent, Benjamin Vitale, who's on the Democratic line. Uh, we have uh, on the phone uh, for this particular uh, forum uh, Jeremy Boyer, the executive editor of The Citizen, who will continue with his question. Mr. Boyer. Thank you. Um, the next question is for all three, um, all three candidates, and uh, it's, it's about redistricting, um, county redistricting specifically, and that's something that um, the the next legislature is going to have to make some decisions about um, based on the, the the new census numbers um, they'll have to decide if new lines should be drawn to try to balance out um, the the current weighted voting system that's that's in place right now um, for county votes for county legislature votes um, and as part of that they can also look at the size of the legislature whether it should be changed um, add seats reduce seats or keep it the same. So I'd like to ask um, all three of you, for you, what are the key priorities here in redistricting? And I guess one option could be just to leave it alone and let the weighted votes fall how they may with uh, the new census numbers. Okay, I believe, uh, Mr. Vitale, you're up first on this question. Um, <clears throat> redistricting is going to be difficult at best. Um, I think as a legislature, the current legislature, um, I think it's uh, pretty well given that we want to reduce the size of the legislature. It's very difficult to make decisions with 15, 15 folks. Um, it's, it's just difficult to have some larger conversations and things. So I think overall the legislature at this point in time believes that the number has to be reduced. The, um, the redistricting itself is going to be very difficult because with the way we vote, um, it's in the city we have wards and we have you know divisions and people vote in different locations. But in the county, um, all the people in Mentz all vote in one place, all the people in Montezuma all vote in one place. And that's, that happens throughout the county. So to try to draw the lines and actually make sure that it, it's going to work during election is going to be, you know, a challenge. Um, but I think it has to be done. The weighted vote is, um, it's okay, but not when it's so out of whack that it is right now. So 
Um, redistricting will happen, and um, it will be very difficult, but I'm sure we'll get there and we'll end up with a, with a little bit smaller legislator, legislature. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Emerson, uh, size, change, redistricting, your thoughts? The, the thought process for myself is the, each town needs to be state whole in whatever redistricting is done. I don't want to see the county legislator reduce to a point that the city runs the county. So the numbers have got to balance. The north end of the county and the south end of the county, there's quite a distance to travel. And if you're out there, like we are campaigning in three towns, if you end up with 10 towns, it's going to be almost impossible to, to stay in contact with your, your voters. Is 15 the right number? I don't know. I'd have to look at the maps and see exactly where it falls. But when they reduced to 15 after the Board of Supervisors, uh, we thought that was a good number. I don't know if there's another number that's as good or, or better. It, it's going to take a lot of study to determine where the district lines are. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Ruffini? I did provide testimony for the NYIRC, <coughs> excuse me, the New York Independent uh, Redistricting Commission. And one of the relevant parts of my testimonies to us specifically in District 3 is that we are very different than cities. The rules and regulations that are made in cities don't necessarily make sense to us. When uh, New York City decided that uh, we had to limit um, the use of uh, guns, um, were they thinking about the folks out in our area who have to protect themselves for, um, from wildlife, uh, who hunt? Um, so, it, you know, there are vast differences between regions. So it would be important to draw district lines that considered the needs of the constituents and what they're made up of. Um, is it a rural community? Is it a, a suburban community? Is it mostly city? Um, I think that it will have to be looked at. Uh, and I think that it is something that, um, like it or not, there will be changes uh, in our county because we don't control all of it. It's a trickle down. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Boyer. Okay. Um, uh, I, I wanted to ask a question um, um, really directed to Mr. Emerson and Mr. Vitale because of your um, your. Well, well, in Mr. Emerson's case, your potential dual role, but in, in Mr. Vitale, you've served on the, the, the school board, which is also an elected office, um, in addition to being on the, the county legislature at the same time. Um, and Mr. Emerson, you're um, being on the, on the uh, Port Byron board, um, the Port Byron board of, uh, village board of trustees. Um, I believe your term expires in 2023. So, um, and I don't know if you've been able to get any more clarity, but um, potentially you could serve both roles. So my question is, um, um, what are your thoughts on, you know, what, why it is or it is not okay for a, a legislator to serve in a second elected position? Um, I guess that's really the question, yeah. Okay, so we're going to give Mr. Emerson and Mr. Vitale two minutes each. Mr. Mrs. Ruffini will have one minute at the end if you want to chime in, and then we'll go back and forth on this issue of double service, summarizing it somewhat. When I'm elected to the county legislature, I'm going to turn in my resignation to the village board. I'm going to let them decide whether or not they accept it and if, or if they want me to continue to finish out my term. I'm going to leave it up to the remaining four members of the village board. As the law says, it's not a conflict, but I think the village board should make that decision, and that's why I'm going to leave it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Vitale, on this issue of double service. When I uh, first considered running for the county legislature, 
I uh, actually went to our school attorney and asked him if there was an issue. I also had the people that were asking me to run to check with the county attorney and they both said there was no conflict. I also um, was the executive director of, this, of the state authority, the regional market at the time, which Cuga County makes two appointments to. And um, I checked with their, our attorney at the regional market and all three said that there is not a conflict. Um, me personally, I, I, as I said earlier, I very much enjoy doing both. Um, I think the, the choice is really constituents if uh, if they don't want me as a as a legislator they have the opportunity to vote if they don't want me as their board representative they have the opportunity to vote um, but I totally appreciate the support that I've gotten and I really really enjoy doing the work that I'm doing in both situ both situations thank you mr. Rufino you have a minute to chime in on your thoughts thank you I think that we have adults here uh, who are used to juggling things, um, business priorities, family priorities. Uh, in the corporate world, if somebody is falling and failing, um, they hear about it. In the representative world, they can hear about it if they're listening to the constituents. I respect the fact that um, a board may decide whether or not somebody holds dual roles, but I respect the voice of the constituents and those are the people who we should be listening to. Thank you. Okay. Well, all right, Mr. Boyer. Okay, um, and, and a specific question for Ms. Ruffini, kind of spinning off of that, the, the, your, your, your two opponents are both people with um, with elected government experience, and, and you're a, a newcomer to um, running for an elected office here in, in QB County. So um, th that brings up the experience question for some voters, and I'd just like to hear your, you know, what, what, what your response would be to a voter who thinks that they would rather hire um, or elect, I should say, um, someone who already has some government elected experience. Okay. You'll have two minutes on this, and your opponents will have one. Thank you. Jeremy, I appreciate that question because it gives me an opportunity to share important information about myself and about what I think with government. Um, I am not doing this because I have nothing else to do. I'm not doing this because I have oodles of money to spend. Um, I'm doing this because I'm a constituent who felt that I was underrepresented in, in, in not offending anyone in this room, please. But overall, um, as a citizen of our county, I felt that my voice was not being represented. And as I talked to people and asked for help, um, I kept running into some barriers uh, and people said, maybe you should run for a position uh, and make those changes, make the differences and make the voices heard. Um, I was an appointed chairman, chairperson um, for the Town of True Planning Board. I was very successful in that. I have uh, leadership skills. I work well with people. Um, I'm diverse. I'm a great listener. I know how to manage meetings, which is something that um, we could use a little more of, meeting management. Uh, and, and again, not offending anyone in this room in all respect, um, we could use more practice with meeting management uh, in government. Um, so I think that the experiences and the background that I have are um, more than adequate to do a good job in um, earning the seat that I will be sitting in uh, beginning next year and uh, being the voices and presenting the choices for our constituents. Thank you. Thank Mr. Vitale, do you have anything to add? No comment, thank you. Mr. Emerson? I think it's very important that the voters know that government works totally different from private industry <coughs> government takes it, it the government line runs very slow nothing is instant so you need to have patience but you also need to know the right people the right connections 
to get things done. That's why I feel moving up from the village board to the county, I have the experience to move that progress along. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Feeney, as I promise, you have one minute to finish this off. Thank you. Over the course of almost two years, I have attended almost every town, village, and school meeting that I could possibly fit into my schedule. Um, I see how things run. I have a very good understanding of how things work. Um, obviously not the intricacies in the executive sessions. Um, however, I do have a basic understanding of what happens when we sit in a room and we have to talk about personnel issues and litigations that are pending. Um, so I will do an amazing job starting January. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Boyer. All right. Um, if uh, we, we still have some time, then I'd like to get into uh, You've water quality. I, I you know it's been brought up. Uh, certainly, um, a, a good portion of the district um, relies on um, Owasco Lake uh, water for 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 its clean uh, water supply, and and there's been challenges with that over the last several years um, with harmful algal blooms and and um, and those kinds of things um, and efforts made to try to, to deal with that from you know changing the watershed rules and regulations to uh, installing carbon filters to plans to try to find a or, or build a, a second water source for the for the county so I'd like to just kind of get your 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 30,000 foot kind of views to start anyway with um, what we need to be doing to ensure water quality, um, you know, in Cayuga County, but, you know, specifically in your district as well um, as we go forward. Okay. Mr. Boyer, just so you know, you've at least one more question, maybe two, depending on the length of answers. Uh, so uh, uh, on water quality, uh, we'll start, uh, I believe the last non-specific candidate answer was from Mr. Vitale, who went first. So Mr. Emerson, you're up first. Thank you. As a member of the Cuyahoga County Water Quality Management Authority, the it, tabs that are coming up are more and more frequent. So we do have to do something about our water quality. The Owasco watershed people are doing a tremendous job of protecting Owasco Lake. We do need a, another water source, and that Cuyahoga Lake is probably the best possible location. I don't have a problem with that. I have a problem with the way the distribution lines are going to be spread out. There, the water line dead ends at Clark Street Road. The Montezuma Wildlife Refuge would like some water. That's a federal agency. There's money in the federal government. I think the line should go from there, either on Laraway Road or up Route 90 and connect to Montezuma. That way their water can be back fed through Montezuma, Port Byron, Weesport, Troop, back to the city of Auburn if there's a break. Right now, if there's a break in the village of Port Byron at certain locations, we will have to shut the water off to Montezuma because we are, are obligated to provide the school with water. So we need, I think loops in the system are very important and that's my problem with the way the system wants to be put in right now. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee. Mrs. Rapini on this issue of water quality. In the town of Montezuma, there is a water committee new, new, newly formed to look at what they are going to do. Uh, there is a mix of some folks who want the water and there are some who do not want the water and basically that's cost driven, uh, which especially now when we're um, facing increased costs and everything that we're going through in this inflation, um, they're even more cost sensitive. Uh, we have some folks in the town of Troop who still do not have water and uh, they, um, some of them want the water out their way. Uh, there are some just a, a short distance from the main line and uh, recently in the comprehensive planning meeting, uh, the woman stood up and said, you know, I, I've been here all along and I have no water. Um, so what about the source? We have farmers who are concerned about the water quality source. We have 
uh, people who are concerned about the water quality and we definitely need to do something about that. Um, what it is, Jeremy mentioned from a 30,000 perspective, 30,000 feet perspective, um, that's the best that I can come up with right now, but there definitely needs to be something done. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Vitelli, on this issue of water quality. Thank you. Um, again, the question I think was about water quality and <clears throat> um, being a lifetime farmer, it seems like a lot of uh, fingers get pointed to agriculture, but agriculture is probably our number one um, business in Kiwi County, so it's really, really important to us. Um, I have always taken the position that we can get a lot further working with our farmers and, and doing things um, voluntarily rather than mandating and, and putting in new laws and things. And, and I think over the last uh, five or six years, that is, that's probably worked to our benefit. And a lot of the farmers in Kiwi County are, are working very hard um, to do the best they can. Accidents still happen and things, but um, I think overall everybody is trying to pull in the right direction. We also know, I was, on, I was um, appointed to the Water and Sewer Authority in 2006. I served for six years before I was a legislator and back then we, we thought we needed and we were working toward getting a second source of water. Um, I was removed at, later on because I didn't fill out a, a uh, financial disclosure form, um, but just recently in uh, March I was reappointed to that board. At that time, um, the county had paid for a regional water project plan and report, uh, over $87,500. The, that project was going south very quickly. When I got on the board, I turned that around, and I think we are, we are looking at, a, a hopefully, in the near future, moving forward with a regional water project that will benefit everybody. The main thing that we have to worry about is cost, and I think with the infrastructure bill that's gonna come through, the, through uh, our federal government that we really need to work hard to be ready for when that money comes so we can benefit the entire Cayuga County. Thank you, Mr. Vitelli. Mr. Boyer, do you have another question? You might get two in here. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I think some of you have, um, have talked about, you know, talking to or, or hearing from or representing constituent views and, and, and viewpoints. Um, and I'd just like to get a sense um, from, from you what what you do or what you would do to gather that information i mean it, it, it's it's one thing to you know talk to everyone that you know in your circle um where, where you may all have similar or, or uh, the same point of views uh, but as an elected legislator you got to try to get the entire or as best you can the the the, the representative thoughts of the, the entire district so what are your what are your thoughts on the approach to um getting or hearing from or getting gathering information from constituents about what they would like you to be doing. So the old Edmund Burke conundrum, do you represent your constituents or represent your own views? And we'll start with uh, Mrs. Rapini. We have already started, we being Lydia for us, <clears throat> have already started a community advisory board. And this is with the purpose of um, forming transparency and being able to know what the voices and the choices of the constituents are. Um, a very important factor that we have addressed is what about the folks who are not tied in um, by electronic devices? And we do have a method where we will be in phone contact with our senior citizens and those without broadband connections and internet um, via a phone chain and other um, regularly scheduled meetings. Uh, the phone chain essentially is for quick, um, quick action uh, where the voice has to go one way or the other immediately. So that is one of the first things that I have done. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Vitali, on this issue of uh, constituents' input. Yeah. I, um, First of all, 
Um, if you go on the county website, we have all the legislators there, and there's a phone number for the legislator. And mine doesn't just go to a phone somewhere in the county office building. It comes directly to my cell phone. And I take all calls. I don't, I don't screen them or anything. And uh, I welcome people to call me. I'm also in the public quite a bit. People can, you know, talk very freely talk to me anytime. Um, in fact, Ms. Ruffini um, actually called to get on the county um, public to be heard, and and uh, although her her um, opinion wasn't the same as my opinion, her opinion was heard by the entire legislature, and I think that's that is important. That is it is good. Um, there's no reason not to um, at least listen to other people's opinions and things, but in the end, um, the person you elect is representing you, and their, their job is to represent you the best they can. They're not always going to agree with you. They're not always, they're, they're not always going to, there's, there's a majority in the minority, and sometimes you're in the minority, um, but that's the, way, that's the way government works. And uh, the most important part is that your opinion is, is, is voiced if you want to voice your opinion. Thank you. Trustee? <clears throat> Each voter has a representative on the town boards in the village. You have the village board. You put them in those positions to represent you at that location. The county legislator is to take the input from each one of those boards and combine it all down and make decisions for the entire district. The people in Montezuma may not think the same way that the people in Troop do, but if you go to your board and explain your positions, then the town board can come to the legislator and tell the legislator, this is what we need, this is what we want. And then that person decides whether or not to go forward with it at the county level. I noticed today there's been complaints in the village about roadside mowing. We are today, they just started mowing the roadsides <coughs> from the county in the village. So it does get done, but you just have to go through the steps to get to the right person. If 4,000 people keep calling the one legislator you never going to get any work. But if you call your village and town boards, tell them what you want, then they can tell their county representative how to handle the situation. Thank you. Do you both want to speak on this? Uh, Mr. Vitale, then Mr. Ruffini, okay. You have one minute. Probably the one most common call I get is, is, is uh, saying that the, the towns or the villages won't listen to them. Um, so. <laughs> So, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know what to, what to say other than if you have a concern, I'm more than welcome, you're more than welcome to call my number. And if nothing else, I'll listen to you and talk to you, and I'll do my best to represent you when it comes to the county legislature. Mrs. Ruffini, you'll have one minute as well. Thank you. It's very important to work as a team. And one of the first things that I established when uh, I was considering running for this opportunity is I reached out to town supervisors and we actually set up weekly um, meetings to kind of talk about what's going on. It was learning for me, a lot of learning, um, and, and there's no reason why different levels of government can't choose to have those types of forums, even if it's a 15 minute once a week session that says, okay, what's going on? What's critical? What do we need to take to the county? Um, thank you. Okay. Mr. Boyer, you're going to allow uh, Mr. Vitale to complete the cycle of each candidate having the same number of first questions, but you're going to only give them a minute to answer that question. So please keep it to uh, a shorter question versus a longer question. <laughs> a short one? Okay. Um, Let's see. <laughs> if it is two minutes, uh, that's fine. That's fine. Let's. Yeah. Well, no. Uh, you know, and I. Um, it, I think this can probably be pretty short. In terms of uh, a big decision that has to be made at some point, it's been kind of kicked down, 
can's been kicked down the road a bit, and I'm sure the pandemic didn't help, um, is the county office building um, in, is, is crumbling and is and in many ways outdated for the needs of county government. Um, so the question I would ask all three is, is do you think that um, the county should be looking for a new, to, to, to build a new county office building or, or move to a different location for um, the central, you know, the centralized location for most of county government? We're gonna give you a minute and a half. This is a little <laughs> bit more complex than that. So a minute and a half for, uh, I, one, I was hoping Jeff. for like five or ten minutes I, on yeah. this. Uh, when I first <laughs> got on the, the simplest question, it's the uh, <laughs> longest answer. <laughs> when I first got on the legislature, this was one of my main concerns was the county office building, and nothing has changed. Um, I hate the word kicking the can down the road, and you went and used it. Um, but anyhow, something has to be done. Um, we did. We do have an RFP <laughs> out right now to look at to assess the county's uh, needs. And um, so I think we're going to move forward a little bit now. But in the past, um, when I was uh, chair of that, of that committee, um, I got my head handed to me on a platter um, because they thought I was going to just spend a lot of money and, and you know, build some kind of Taj Mahal. But um, our county office building is, uh, is old, it's tired, and it's got a lot of asbestos. And um, we need to look look for something different, new maybe, maybe not, um, but it needs to stay in the city of Auburn. And um, I guess I'll just conclude with that because I don't want to take too much time. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Emerson, County Office Building. Mr. Boyer, we talked about this earlier. Um, a lot of counties now are taking the, uh, the empty malls and turning them into county complexes. The Finger Lakes Mall has the J.C. Penney store empty. Uh, that might be a possibility of using for one of the county agencies. Uh, the emergency management office has always been in the basement. I've always been scared that if we had a flash flood and it went down into the, the basement of the county office building and took out the emergency backup system uh, to the communications, we'd be in deep trouble. So I'm hoping that between the city and the county, we can uh, share services and maybe move some of those agencies out of the harm's way, I would call it. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Ruffini, you get the last word. That's scary. Um, we do have real estate in our county that can be utilized. Building a new building is probably not what the constituents want because right away we think about spending money. And it is not cheap to put up a new building, especially now. But I don't think it'll happen right away. Um, as far as uh, refurbishing existing um, facilities, uh, there would be another thing that had, had to be looked at from a location and from a rebuild perspective. Um, you mentioned asbestos, and asbestos is a great concern in a lot of the older buildings, so we would have to be cognizant of those things and other public safety matters. Uh, yes, the building that um, I will be in in January um, is in need of attention, uh, but do we want to give it that kind of attention or are there better places to go? I think it is something that should be moved on quicker rather than waiting longer, another seven years or so, to make something happen. But we have to get people on board. We have to show them it has to be done. And the constituents need to buy in. And maybe with constituents buy in, we'll be able to move it forward quicker. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Boyer, for your questions. We're now going to uh, turn to closing statements. And as we said at the beginning, we reversed <coughs> the order uh, for this. We'll now hear from uh, Benjamin Vitale, who's the uh, incumbent in, uh, in the position, and he is on the Democratic line. Mr. Vitale. Again, thank you for everyone, everyone listening, and everyone here making this possible. Um, as I've said probably two or three times today, um, I very much enjoy what I'm doing. I very much enjoy serving the public. Um, it was mentioned by one of the uh, 
candidates that they don't have a lot of money. I don't have a lot of money either, so I, I look for ways to give back to my community. And this is one of the things that I know I can do, and I really enjoy it. And um, it's probably one of the best ways that you can give back to your community. So I'd just like to thank you for everything that you supported me in the past and hope continue to support me in the future. And I'll, uh, I'll work hard and do the best I can for you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vitelli. We'll now hear from Lydia Patty Ruffini, who is on the Republican and For Us, By Us party line. Thank you. And thank you all constituents for taking the time to watch this. It's very important that you know what's going on in your community. Um, we blame a lot of things on the people running our government, uh, but if we don't take action, if we don't get involved, if we don't sit in on those meetings, we have ourselves to blame. I was there. I did not get involved. I decided that I would let my representatives take care of me and save my families while I was busy um, paying my bills and uh, focusing on my career. Um, and then when I looked up, I found that it wasn't my voice that was being represented. So that was my fault. But now I'm going to change that. And now we're going to bring our voices into the rooms and we are going to make sure that our representatives know what we want, especially at the local levels. The grassroots level, that's where we make the real changes. Um, you have issues, you have concerns. You need to bring them to your towns, to your village, to your school. You need to do that respectfully and you need to be in contact with your representatives. Um, every piece of literature that I have uh, disseminated has my contact information. Um, email, website, phone number, especially the phone number because we know not everybody is plugged in. So please, um, get out there and vote November 2nd. I look forward to serving you from uh, 160 Genesee Street as we start things uh, starting in January. And I thank you very much for getting out there and voting because if you don't make a choice, somebody else decides for you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear from Jeffrey Emerson, uh, who is on a conservative and independent lines. Mr. Emerson. I want to thank the college for hosting us again. <clears throat> it's time that the voters found out everything that's going on. You elected me to the village board. The village board has done a tremendously physical, financial, responsible budget for you voters. I want to take that same mentality to the county level. It's important that every dollar that the county takes in is spent wisely. I ask that you vote for me. I ask that I thank you for your support. I hope you understand that I am not going door to door because of the Delta variant of the COVID-19. I want to thank Mr. Boyer for his questions. I think we covered a whole big range of items that are going on in the county. My issues are we've got to do something with the fire and EMS service. We've got to help those folks out. We got to do something about the water transmission lines. We have to do something to get a county executive onto the ballot. And we have to do something about communication. We've got to communicate better between government and constituent. I don't know how to do that other than being present at these type of events. I thank you. I thank you for your support. Thank you, and thank you all three for not only being here, but also for putting yourselves out there. Not easy, especially during this time of a pandemic, but for you and your families, thank you for your commitment to public service. We also want to thank Mr. Boyer for his thoughtful questions as usual. We look forward to having him back in the studio uh, with our next forum on uh, Tuesday of next week. Uh, and most importantly, we want to thank you for taking the time to listen to these three candidates for the third legislative uh, district. We hope it helps you make up your mind of who you will vote for uh, come uh, Election Day on November 2nd, or if you choose to do early voting, which starts in about three weeks. We will return on Tuesday with our next forum, this time for the county's uh, ninth uh, district, which includes Ledger, Scipio, and Springport, legis uh, uh, legislative district. Incumbent Democrat and Working Party's Family, Working Families Party candidate, Keith Batman, who is the uh, 
incumbent will be facing off Republican and conservative Robert Shea. We had hoped to bring you the ninth legislative uh, district uh, forum next week. Excuse me, it was the seventh before, now the ninth, uh, with the Republican conservative Mark Strong, who was appointed to fill the position within the last year, replacing Charlie Ripley, who uh, went back to a different position, uh, with Geraldine Germano Yaw, who was on the Democratic and Working Families lines, but Mr. Strong has declined to participate. As per our past practice with all candidates in all races, we will have Ms. Germano Yaw in the studio next Thursday for a one-on-one -on -one interview. Uh, we have also offered uh, to both surrogate candidates, John Boodleman and Ben Sussman, time afterwards to present their credentials. Mr. Sussman uh, has so far uh, replied that he will be attending. He's on the Democratic and Working Families line, and we will hope that Mr. Boodleman, who is on the Republican and Conservative lines, will join us as well. We'll also have forums planned as we uh, head into the end of October for the 11th, 13th, and 15th legislative districts, all in the city of Auburn. And we'll end on our, with our biannual city council forum on October 26th. Because of the number of forums we have this year, the citizen on their website, auburnpub.com, will have these forums downloaded immediately upon taping. And you can also see them at Cuga Media on the YouTube channel that the college runs. The Auburn Regional Media Access, ARMA, will run these forums this Saturday and Sunday on Spectrum Channels 12 and 98 and Fios 31. And you'll be able to listen uh, in, on the radio at Win 89 on Saturday morning at 10 a.m. I'm Guy Cosentino for Q Community College. We want to thank you for watching. We hope you have a good night, have a great tomorrow, and be safe and healthy.